begin with a little bit of a history on some of the driving forces behind the federal environmental law rollbacks of 2012. For a few years preceding, you know, we have access to information documents that show that industry was actively lobbying the federal government to make changes to federal environmental laws to, to streamline processes. Essentially speed up reviews and bring more certainty to industry. So in December 2011, this organization, the Energy Framework Initiative, which is comprised of these four industry association groups, wrote a letter to the Minister of Natural Resources and the Minister of Environment. Asking essentially for regulatory reform of all of Canada's major environmental laws. Advocating for, as I said, a reduction in red tape to speed up the processes and to speed up the, the timelines that it took, or the time that it took for projects to get approved. The response was essentially, a, well, this response was a confirmation that the Minister of Natural Resources was behind industry's requests. That's when we saw this real outlash, this backlash towards environmental groups, the, the labeling of anybody concerned about public participation and the protection of our, our land and air and water as foreign funded radicals. Um, yeah, you know, I think probably most of you remember this. Uh, this was a real turning point in the conversation between environmental groups and, and non-environmental groups. Any citizens concerned about protection of their fish, protection of their wildlife, protection of their waters, and the federal government. When the federal government really took on this advocacy role for industry. And then speeding up into the spring and then the fall of 2012, we saw the two big omnibus bills. So Bill C-38 and Bill C-45. Between those two bills, the Fisheries Act was gutted, and I'm gonna go into detail into each of these changes. The, Fed the Fisheries Act was gutted, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act was repealed and replaced with a whole new environmental assessment law called CIA 2012. The Species at Risk Act was tweaked. The Kyoto Protocol Implementation Act, the only law establishing mandatory greenhouse gas reduction targets, was completely axed. The Navigable Waters Protection Act was rewritten into a new act called the Navigation Protection Act that removed legal protection from over 99% of Canada's lakes and rivers. So essentially handing industry exactly what it had requested in its lobbying to the federal government one year earlier. So starting with the changes to the environmental assessment law, one of the, one of the most significant changes that was made was in what projects get assessed. So it used to be the case under the old law that any federal project, any project that required a federal approval or occurred on federal lands or got federal funding or where the federal government was a proponent, if it involved the federal government in some way, it got some level of environmental assessment. Some were just screening levels, it wasn't a perfect act. Some of them got more comprehensive reviews, comprehensive studies they were called, those ones were listed out into a schedule, but, but they all got some kind of consideration for their potential social and environmental and economic impacts. Under the new act, that approach was scrapped and a different approach called the listing approach was implemented. So now the only projects that get a federal environmental assessment are the ones that are listed in regulations and they're only listing the major projects. So as a result, 3,000 environmental assessments got scrapped the month after this new law came into, into force. So approximately 90% of the projects that used to get a federal environmental assessment no longer get any kind of federal review. Another major change was under the new act, the, what's considered an environmental effect, that definition has been narrowed. 
So in some cases, socioeconomic factors don't get considered. Um, the, the effects, for example, of uh, the environment on projects, which can then affect how those projects interact with their environments, that doesn't get considered. So even in the projects that are getting assessed, fewer factors are being considered. A really significant difference is the imposition of mandatory timelines. Um, industry had complained that environmental assessments sometimes took way too long, and in a couple of cases they did. Reports under that have started to come out under this new law and under the mandatory timelines is that there is no significant difference in the amount of time that reviews are taking now compared to before. Most reviews occurred within the same amount of time that these mandatory timelines require. <coughs> The problem with the mandatory timelines is that for those really complicated projects that need a lot of information considered or just have a, a huge citizen concern involved, they don't, they're not all able to be expanded to have all the, the information that people want to have considered considered. So for example, I was representing a group on the environmental assessment of the Site C Dam up in northeastern BC. We're talking tens of thousands of pages of information and hundreds of individuals and groups wanting to participate in the reviews, and all of that got squeezed into a month-long hearing. Groups had about a two-week, I think it was a two-week notice period between when BC Hydro, the proponent's information was declared final, and when they had to submit the deadline for submitting their own expert reports, analyzing those, <coughs> I think it was at that point, 11,000 pages of information, two weeks to review that information, to retain experts, to analyze it, and to prepare their own responses. It just, it, it completely, uh, I don't want to say it, it muzzled citizens, but it was a real strain, a huge strain on participants to get robust information before the panel. Uh, so that leads to the limitation of public participation, um, and it, especially with regards to hearings that are conducted by the National Energy Board. And a significant change is that in order to be to participate as a member of the public, you have to pass a standing test. It used to be the case that the public just got to participate in environmental assessments of projects that concern them. Now, in a lot of cases, you have to you know, be considered to be directly affected. And then finally, under the new act, the federal government can now just substitute provincial processes for federal ones. So we have a provincial environmental assessment regime here in BC. The provincial government conducts environmental assessments of projects under its own law. It's a, a much, it's a much, we even under, even compared to the new Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, the BC process is a lot weaker than the federal one. The law doesn't require anything except a, a broad requirement for public participation, but it doesn't give any details about what that looks like. So, the federal government under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act 2012 can now just, if, the, if BC applies to the feds and says, dear feds, don't do your own review, just rely on ours for your decision, and the federal minister of environment decides that in her opinion, a substitution would be an appropriate thing, then she has to approve the substitution request. What we've seen since they entered into BC and the federal government entered into a memorandum of understanding is that every single request made by the province for a substitution has been approved. It's up to 10 or it might be 12 now projects that have triggered environmental assessments under SIA 2012 aren't getting a federal review. Which is a major concern because Having a federal involvement, let's say a project needs permits by the Minister of Environment or DFO, they can be called to be experts by the province, but the level of participation is likely to be quite a bit less by the federal government in a provincial assessment than if it was conducting its own expertise. We don't know if the province has the relevant expertise to even be asking the right questions in a provincial assessment that would cover all of the federal issues of concern. So we're monitoring. We haven't seen the results of any of the, the substituted assessments yet, but 
the environmental community is very concerned that by allowing these substitutions, we're creating all sorts of regulatory gaps and gaps in the information that's going to be considered in project permitting. And so another major federal law that was amended significantly in 2012 was the Fisheries Act. There were a couple of key ways that the act was changed. One was it, the new provisions have changed the threshold of the harm, the level of harm that can be done to fish habitat. So under the old act, any harmful alteration, damage, or destruction of fish habitat was prohibited. Now under the new provision, only serious harm to fish is prohibited. Right, and so DFO has actually come out with a policy on what serious harm to fish means, which is a, a fairly favorable, it was kind of the best case policy or the best case interpretation they could have applied, which is terrific, but we have now in the legislation a much different standard of, of protection that's applied over fish habitat, which means that if industry challenges DFO's policy on how it's interpreting serious harm and industry wins in court, then we have a weaker law. Um, and also, we just have less certainty. I mean, what is serious harm to fish compared to harmful damage, destruction, and alteration? Um, a second major change is that the Act now doesn't protect all fish species. It used to protect all fish, fish species from, from harmful alteration, damage, and destruction. Now it only, that protection only applies to fish that belong to a fishery or support a fishery's fish. What is a fisheries fish? And there's some DFO policy, it's equally confusing. It, it essentially says that a fisheries fish is a fish that belongs to a fishery. <laughs> <laughs> a recreational, commercial, or aboriginal fishery. In BC, DFO, I've heard conflicting things from DFO about what they're interpreting as a, as a fisheries fish. One interpretation is that if it's regulated by the province, then it's a fisheries fish. But I've also heard you know, including from members of this group here, that there are some species that DFO has, is potentially not considering to be either a fisheries fish or a supporting fish, which means that those habitat protection provisions aren't applying. Um, another major area of concern that's been introduced into the Act is that it broadly expanded Cabinet's power to authorize harm, to prescribe to persons the ability to authorize harm. So now cabinet can just make regulations saying this industry association has power to authorize serious harm to fish. Um, we've seen regulations now coming down under these new powers. Uh, right now, cabinet's considering new aquaculture activities regulations that would just give blanket authorization to fish farms to dump aquatic drugs and pesticides into waters without needing a permit. So you need to have a permit to have the fish farm, but you no longer need a permit to dump the aquatic drugs and pesticides into the ocean. And that's under this new expanded power that these changes gave to cabinet. I'm sorry, it's not a very cheerful talk. <laughs> So our new Navigation Protection Act, uh, the most significant change that was made to that act is that it used to be the case that the Navigable Waters Protection Act protected all of Canada's navigable waters, which was interpreted under the common law as being anything that you could float a canoe or a log down, protected all of those waters from any kind of interference if a, if a company wanted to you know, dig a ditch or build a bridge or impede with navigation <coughs> any way they needed to get a permit and that triggered an environmental assessment. That provision was changed so that the only waters that are protected from any kind of interference with navigation, the only ones that are protected now are listed on a schedule. So just like under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, you see that everything got assessed used to be that all waters were protected. Now only the ones that are listed on a schedule to the Act, only a little bit less than 1% of Canada's navigable waters are listed on the schedule. So for example, there isn't a body of water on Vancouver Island that's protected under the Navigation Protection Act. Powell River is protected. The Pacific Ocean is protected, that's nice of them. 
uh, the Fraser River, for example, so only the really major water bodies. Oh, and then uh, that last one's a, a gem. The NEB was given jurisdiction over the navigational <coughs> impacts of pipelines. So the NEB, when it's reviewing pipeline applications, it assesses and determines whether or not to give permits and you know what level of environmental review to apply to the impact on navigation. And then of course, the ancillary impacts that are considered are the environmental impacts. So that was in 2012. And we're seeing a renewed interest in further rolling back federal environmental legal protection. About two months ago, a letter surfaced from um, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, urging the federal government to make amendments to the Species at Risk Act that would introduce, a, they call it a balance between industry in interests and the protection of species at risk. So what they're asking for is to have scientific information just advise the minister and then instead of being the basis for a decision to protect species at risk, just be, just to play an advisory role. And then for the ultimate decision to be, a com to com be completely at arm's length from any mandatory requirements. In other words, they're asking for the politicization of the decision making <coughs> by the Minister of Environment with regards to species at risk. And they're also asking for economic and social factors to be considered when deciding to, for example, you know what to put into a recovery strategy and what to what to trigger the um, the environmental protections that would occur for species at risk. We haven't seen any changes. I haven't seen any changes so far proposed to the Species at Risk Act. Um, uh, we're definitely concerned. The. Uh, the latest change, and this one I just learned about a couple of weeks ago. So the federal government has introduced another omnibus budget bill, Bill C-43. They are proposing to make changes to the Canada Marine Act that would allow cabinet to make regulations that would hand over regulatory, administrative, and judicial control of industries or or classes of industry in ports to any person. So any person could all of a sudden be the regulator of a type of industry in Portland. So coal or LNG, the regulation of that within a port could go to a particular proponent, it could go to an industry body, it could go to a province, it could go to a local government, it could go to the port authority itself, the federal government wants to give itself the power to just divest its responsibility over the shipping of whatever kinds of industry it, it chooses to over to somebody else. Um, the change is also proposed to give cabinet power to make regulations that would uh, prescribe certain information that would have to be kept confidential with respect to activities on port lands. Uh, to authorize the destruction of any documents related to certain activities. The amendments would let port authorities, this is an interesting one, they would let port authorities buy federal land, so ports exist on federal land, right? So under these provisions, the port authority would get to buy those lands and then lease them out to industry so that it's no longer a federal port, it's an industry shipment, shipping port that's regulated by, let's say, BC or an industry association or the Port Authority. Uh, and then the, the federal government and Port Authorities would be shielded from any kind of civil lawsuits or fines related to damage to human health or you know, harm to the environment from these activities. So the, the feds didn't listen, right? When the 2012 changes occurred, Tens of thousands of Canadians spoke out against them, from scientists to everyday citizens to you know, conservation groups to rotten gun clubs, 
former federal fisheries ministers, collective three federal former fisheries ministers, collectively wrote a letter to the federal government saying that these changes were irresponsible and requesting all sorts of amendments. Not one of the provisions that were originally proposed in the bills got altered in any way. The federal government just ignored people's requests. We'll see where this goes. I don't have a lot of confidence that that they'll listen this time around. Um, but we are hoping that we can generate an even larger citizen response this time. I think one of the lessons that we learned from the last omnibus bills in 2012 was that we need more than the tens of thousands of people from across Canada. We need people to really organize themselves. We need people to organize themselves according to the regions that they're in, and we need people to reach out beyond their comfort zones, right? Beyond the customary allies. So not just talking to other conservation and environmental groups, but talking to labor unions and talking to non-traditional allies like rod and gun clubs, like other people who, the commercial fishers, for example, who will be impacted by these changes and who might oppose them, but who aren't traditionally activists in nature. So we have a few tools um, that we're offering on our website. I administer this website called envirolawsmatters.ca. You'll see it on the back of the handout that's given there. We have a petition, Stop the Rollback of Canada's Environmental Laws. I have it here. I encourage you to sign it. It's also available on the website. We periodically, I mean, I'll be putting this out probably in the next week, periodically we do action letters to MPs or to various government officials on, on federal environmental law rollback. So I'll be putting together a letter writing tool on the website with regards to this bill C-43. Um, really importantly, keep the conversation going in your communities. You know, write letters to the editor, write op-eds. I know many of you have done that ad nauseum and feel like you're I, I've been reaching out to groups now for quite a while, and I, you know, I get a lot of a sense of frustration from people that you know we've tried this before and we've written letters and we. But I think we need another push. Um, we have a lot of literature on this website too on the on the changes. So just inform yourselves, download copies of the petition, download the pamphlets that we have, and hand them out. Um, you know, feel free to contact me. Always, start, you know, I'm happy to come up and do group talks. 